Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their organization and community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia, and I'd like to welcome a good friend of mine, Aaron. Hello. From, the, from Burgess. We'll get into all that um, in a second, but thank you for joining me on the show. I really it's appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So now the title of the show is Mission Control. So what we like to do is start out with what is the mission of your organization? Well, again, thank you for having me on uh, your podcast. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, we've been working together uh, since 2014. And so uh, it is a pleasure to, to be here and uh, to, to talk. Um, I am the uh, Director of Marketing and Communications for the Burgess Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation here on Michigan State University's campus. And the, the mission of the organization with which I work is to uh, prepare uh, students, uh, Michigan State University students, for the the outside world to prepare them with an entrepreneurial mindset and to support them as they build their businesses here on campus. Awesome. So now you talked about um, what you do or your title a little bit. What, what is all entailed? I know that oh. it's, it's one, it's one thing on paper, but it's many things in the real world. And what does that mean? It's true. Um, so I think for any of us working in the marketing and communication space, we are uh, professionals who uh, first and foremost, think of ourselves as storytellers. So my objective as, um, as the communicator here at the Burgess Institute is to uh, tell vivid and compelling stories about our student makers, um, shakers and change makers um, here on campus, as well as to, to, uh, to uh, court um, Spartan alums who are interested in, in uh, doing philanthropic donation uh, to the Institute as well as helping uh, Spartan alums who may be interested in starting their own businesses find resources. So I, I'm the guy that uh, tells you where the resources are and who to connect with and all that with a storytelling background. That's interesting. Let's, let's dig into that. How did you, when you say storytelling background, what does that mean? So, wow. Um, I, I sort of stumbled into this as a professional career, I think, for um, a, a number of years in my youth, uh, which feels so far um, removed now. Um, I, I always wanted to be a secondary education uh, English teacher. Um, I, I, for the longest time, wanted to teach in, in high school. And so uh, my final year of undergrad, I... I was taking uh, one of my my courses to prepare me for student teaching, and they threw me in a seventh grade classroom. And I said, you know, not so much, not for me. Um, I, I just, I, I, you know, it it takes a, a person with a special temperament and a skill set to to work with that age group. And um, I can tell you unequivocally that I don't possess that gene. Um, but uh, I did want to stay in education. And so I went and I got my Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing Poetry. Um, and for me, that's where the, the obsession about storytelling started. I mean, I was in creative writing classes uh, throughout my undergrad, um, but it really solidified as, as a possibility uh, profession-wise uh, to go and be a storyteller. And so I finished my my graduate degree in 2004. Um, I taught for a while, whether that's uh, that was teaching bread and butter courses at uh, Front Range Community College, including like uh, uh, 
forgive me, now I'm spacing, uh, teaching women in literature, teaching um, advanced college composition, um, beginning college composition. I mean, all bread and butter courses. And so long story short, um, when I came back to Michigan in 2011, um, I knew I, I wanted to start looking for work that, that really leveraged my, my storytelling capabilities. And I stumbled on a great job in uh, 2014 with Michigan Biotechnology Institute. And that's where my storytelling skills really um, came into hand. Hmm. That's, that is interesting. So how did you go from, uh, what was it called? MBI? Yep. Or what, what, what um, I don't remember what the, you, you just Michigan said. Michigan Biotechnology yeah, Institute. That, yeah. How did you go from there, which, okay, before I get into that, what did Michigan Biotech Institute do? What, what, what was their, uh, their story? So um, MBI was a nonprofit institute that um, was really trying to commercialize technologies coming out of Michigan State. Um, they they would commercialize uh, via fermentation processing, and they had fallen upon a technology called Afex that they were looking to scale up and and get on the world stage. And so my my job was to um, really leverage um, branding and storytelling to to really. Um, formulate how you talk about this technology with the general public. Um, it, it was, it, it's an incredible technology. Um, it, it basically used, um, uh, it, it used sort of waste materials that were left on the fields. Um, you can, you know, for instance, corn stalks and whatnot, you could pull a sustainable amount of that material off the fields and then put it through an ammoniation process. Um, and you would come out with feed that um, had their sugars available for ruminant animals to, 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 to digest more efficiently. Um, and in developing countries, that's a huge thing. In a lot of areas, people um, will burn off the former crops, which that's uh, terrible for the environment. It's ter terrible for people's lungs. Um, and then it was a waste of, of organic matter for cattle to eat. And the objective was to increase milk production within cattle and other ruminant animals to feed, like to feed a population. So my job was to tell that story and uh, figure out ways to get people to, to um, back the project. Okay, I'm not going to hang on this too much, but I'm interested. Okay. How did you tell that story? I mean, what, how, because, I mean, if you think about it, it is a high level technology that yep. is, is gleaned from everyday things. How did you tell this story? I mean, what was the, what was the key aspect that you were like really dove into to get people to understand? what the organization is doing. So I think it all starts from a, a, a point of humanity. So um, one way of hooking the uh, philanthropist was to say, look, you're doing, by investing in this project, you're helping to increase productivity of cattle, um, to, to increase the likelihood that developing uh, individuals in a developing nation will have access to more milk. Milk is, for instance, in India, it is the, um, the first food of choice uh, for cooking and uh, is a major protein source. And so for us, the, the, the storytelling was, look, it, this technology is available. And if we can get it to scale, we can feed millions of people. And that's where, that's the hook for these individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and so that my objective was to stay on the human side of the technology. Like what is the impact that's being created uh, by this technology and what your role as a, a philanthropist is in bringing this technology to market. Wow. 
Well, I mean, it worked. So it did. I mean, I I can understand where that correlation is happening, and you know, using it because you know you you hit on key key terms that I always use when we talk about the storytelling we do for different organizations. So moving from MBI, you ended up at MSU. How is that really? Because that's going to be two completely different stories that you have to tell. Yes. So, I mean, I, I so lovely enough, the MBI was a, a subsidiary of the MSU Research Foundation. Um, after I left MBI, I went to the MSU Research Foundation. I was their first communicator in, in their existence in 43 years. And um, we, we, they had a, a giant portfolio of subsidiary companies. And, and part of that was um, student focused. And so um, without getting too into the weeds, I'll just say that for me, um, going from, as a storyteller, you have to find the impact uh, that, that, that's really um, setting an organization apart. And so for, for me to, to come to uh, MSU and start telling stories of these amazing student creators um, and as well as faculty members who are, who are uh, inspiring the, the work of students and who are shaping the future of, uh, of the marketplace, um, it didn't feel like too much of a transition, like still the, the principles apply of storytelling. So, you know, where's the hook? Where's the impact? Um, can you tell a story that's uh, beginning, middle and end? And, uh, and that end is usually success. And, and that's usually where um, people, I want people to walk away from the stories we tell inspired and wanting to continue either the work that we're doing or uh, to join our community. Well, it's interesting in what you just mentioned with uh, the Research Foundation is that you were their first communicator in 43 years. Yes. Yes, I was. That's a huge gap of not talking to folks appropriately. Yeah. So what yeah. was the obstacles that you had to – because that's like almost you had to like reinvent their whole persona. Yes. Kind um, of. And I mean, I don't want to take – all, all of that, but I mean, but sim simply on day to day conversation and in day to day uh, outreach, you had to really reintroduce a community to a community. How yes. did you do that? Um, so I think for for me, the the first step was a learning. So I don't think that a communicator can instantaneously walk into an organization and be expected to uh, know exactly the ins and outs. I mean, it, it literally took nine months for me to wrap my head around uh, what we were what we were doing, what the focus was. And so I think a key part of storytelling is listening. You know, what are the experiences that people are having? What, you know, sitting in on meetings and, and learning uh, about what each sector is doing within a, a, an organization that has multiple subsidiaries um, and, and really beginning to configure what the story is. Um, I think for 43 years, they were told to sit in the background and just uh, throw money over the fence. And um, that, that worked for a time. But um, what we began, what I began to see is that there is an incredible value. Like the MSU Research Foundation has um, several uh, startup incubators around town and in Grand Rapids. They offer amazing programs that helps uh, that help uh, startups and entrepreneurs reach their goals. I mean, here at uh, the Innovation Center, we've got the the Tick, which is an MSU Research Foundation owned um, uh, small incubator and co working space. Um, we've got. Uh, the Van Camp Labs, which allows scientists and other startups to to launch their businesses and take risks that they normally wouldn't be able to take if they didn't have a lab space. Um, so there were there were plenty of ways to see how 
the MSU Research Foundation was working within the community and doing incredible work. I mean, there's there's very deep ties between, for instance, the MSU Research Foundation and LEAP, the Lansing Economic Area Partnership. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and <laughs> and uh, the Lansing Smart Zone. And so being able to to observe and see how all of these things interconnect and intersect within the foundation that like that became a really easy thing to talk about what are the successes what are the the ways that um you know the foundation helps to promote uh technologists and innovators for, so for instance the the mcu research foundation um a professorship that that you know funds professors for five years to to take on technologies and to further their work um there are countless ways to be able to to center that story my objective then in 2016 was to ensure that um the the mothership brand uh, and its satellite brands spoke to one another and and were were able to tell this the overarching story which is success here at michigan state university Awesome. Wow. Well, before we get to your next stop, I do, I do want to ask you because you've, you've talked about a lot of different differing aspects of your, of, of your storytelling journey uh, for other organizations, but what do you, what brings joy to you as a communicator? Oh, what, what are, what are some of the things that, I mean, I know that you're going to get into a little bit more because we haven't talked about Burgess. You haven't even got to the present day, <laughs> and so. But what have, what do you really what What is the big thing that that you really enjoy doing day to day that gets you gets you going? Oh wow, what gets me out of bed uh, every morning? A uh, coffee? No, um, <laughs> that, um, that's a cop I, out. <laughs> that is a total cop out, but it's. It's not a lie. No, um, it's no, not. I think <laughs> what gets me out of bed and motivates me and what gives me joy as a communicator is, man, how do I, tell, how do I say this succinctly? Um, I think, A, just knowing that um, every day is different for me, uh, that, that, there are different expectations and there's going to be uh, ways to be able to reflect the, what really gets me out of bed is being able to uh, step into the office and work with students uh, from all across campus. Um, I love, I love teaching. Um, I, I love the academic environment. And so what gets me out of bed as a storyteller is being able to see each of these students grow and succeed and and being able to be a part a small part of that journey with them uh it it's what brings me great joy well and so that's a great segue good job you must be thank you you must, you must work with words and stuff so, <laughs> i must <laughs> um but you know you now are at the uh, Burgess Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Yep. And let me ask you this is like, how do you, you've already explained how you like working with the students and you like um, telling the overall organizational story and how, how that outreach reaches the world. But as a communicator, you're not technically an entrepreneur. I don't think that talking about your journey to this point, you ever were one, how do you no. communicate as one? How do you communicate, number one, to the entrepreneurs within the program, but also communicate out there about their journey, illustrating their journey to, to the wider world? So I would, I would say that one, artists, uh, in general, whether you're uh, a writer, whether you're a poet, whether you're working with visual medium, um, e we are 
all entrepreneurs, we see a problem and we want to fix it. So as a storyteller, I see a gap in a narrative and I want to fix it. And that means I have to um, write incredible work and it's going to either be accepted or not accepted by the public. Um, and so uh, when I fail, I have to pivot. And when I succeed, I have to uh, double down and keep going with what I find to be success. And so my experience as a an artist first and foremost a storytelling artist um is is very similar to the journey that these entrepreneurs take um they see a a problem within the marketplace or they see uh, a pitfall that uh, a current product uh, poses and they are willing to take the risk to to go after a solution and so uh, our uh, we may come from different approaches, but we definitely uh, end up in the same place. Um, so for me, um, being able to relay in, in a story what it is that the the student entrepreneur is is going through, whether that's like this is what we discovered and this is what um, we found our customers most wanted, and we went after it, and then you know taking that risk to start the business to to doing customer discovery to being able to do um, the the prototyping and then you know all that assessment and then to launch I think um, at every single one of those those stations in their business that is a story to be told um, of course we I we serve 800 uh, students right now in the minor and you know 1200 students who are in the venture creation programming and so I don't get a chance to tell every single one of those stories and not every single one of those uh, stations in in their development but what I do have to do is select some of the the uh, underrepresented voices and tell their story, um, whether that is doing a feature on them or developing a video that features them or, and so there's uh, my day look, like I said, looks very different from day to day. Mm -hmm. Um, for instance, right now I'm in the, the process of, of developing a video series, uh, to promote an event that's coming. Um, we, we then have an editorial calendar that celebrates, uh, various, um, there's a lot of ums and ohs. So I apologize. It's like a Monday in my brain. Um, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've got, uh, let's see here. We've got several student, uh, view stories that are coming up. And so my job is to, um, make sure that the process is fulfilled, that we're producing excellent work and, and, uh, that the public is enjoying what we're producing. Yeah, I think, I think they do. And so it's like, Thank you. Um, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is just it's just engaging. And it's also it's not but it's not just good stories uh, for the sake of just the student, but it's a good story for the overall university. Um, it's yes, just, it's just a really good promotional aspect of, you know, seeing a program do its best and and uh, and hearing how that works and so with that um is there do you feel like because you are in a uh, huge governmental infrastructure as as a public university is yep. do you feel like there's some uh communication or interesting communication situations shall we say that um that where departments don't don't interact uh you know what i'm saying it's like yeah it's just it's just like how as a communicator do you do you do you view, view some of the 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 uh some of the struggles that you know big giant organizations have yeah um i think well so what's wonderful is that, and I feel like I'm the luckiest communicator on the campus, our program reaches uh, across the campus. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether you are earning your, your um, degree at the Broad College of Business or you're at 
Karma Sai or Nat Sai. Like it doesn't matter for us. You can come into our program and and take advantage of the resources. You can declare your minor and we view it as complimentary. So for instance, you're if you're going into to if you're if you're aiming to be a vet, well, you still need to know how to run a business. You still need to know how to keep your book straight, that you know how to interact with um with lawyers that you need to learn how to market your business um, so that, you know, you might have customers. Um, so for, for us, we view the intersectionality to be, to be bright and, and that people, uh, that students really do value that intersection. In terms of being a communicator, um, my job in this unit is to make sure that my colleagues across campus know that we're celebrating their students. And I've received so many um, messages from fellow communicators that, that, that our unit keeps them up to date, lets them know what we're celebrating, who we're celebrating, why we're celebrating them. And that is incredibly valued because it's another story for them to tell and to shine the light on them. So. I feel very, very blessed that to be in the position that I am. Um, and I don't necessarily uh, run up against certain silos. I feel like we're bridge builders in that aspect. That is, that's, that's an excellent, excellent counter to what I was saying. I mean, because the simple fact is you are absolutely right. There can be silos, but there doesn't have to be. And, exactly. and, I, and I think that that's, that's really key. Um, and so, you know, as as a lifelong communicator such as yourself and, and, and doing uh, and working with students and also not working with students, but what do you feel like the young people you are around today um, really understand about what, what they get about communication um, and what don't they get? What do they, oh. what do they get and what don't they get about communication today? Um, so, I mean, I will, I will say that, you know, I am a firm Gen Xer. I was born in 1977. So I, um, I grew up alongside like analog alongside digital. Mm -hmm. um, I, I turned 47 in April or I turned 47 in April and um, I am, I am, absolutely absolutely flabbergasted at people who don't understand uh communications tools because i feel like they've been with us forever like we, so what do the students today uh, <laughs> get uh, i mean i i mean i the, it's I don't even have words. Like they understand the immediacy of communication. They understand the power of audiences. Um, they also understand the dark side of that that power with audiences because they're barraged with information on the daily. Um, I think what they um, what they don't get is slow communications. Like they they don't understand that that relationships with um, brands or with influencers happen over time and that you have to build trust with these individuals. Um, they just see the immediacy of, of communications and they want immediate results. And I think that applies to their patients with everything in life. Um, I think that they get frustrated when they don't see immediate success or they don't see immediate uh, response. I'm like, no, no, it's okay. Like not mm. everything happens at the, the speed of TikTok. Um, I also think that um, they are, are Gen Zers and Gen Alphas. They're, they don't understand email and they don't read anymore, um, which is concerning to me because written communication is is sort of the baseline and um when you lose that connection then i mean they don't open emails they don't they they don't read text on on static posts on instagram it's just bypassed so there are workarounds video has become really the the first language of of this generation um but there's no patience. 
there's no patience at all. You try long form on this new generation and it, it just, I don't know how, like, did, did they see Oppenheimer like three hours in a movie theater? Like I could barely sit through that. Um, but yeah, and now I'm babbling. Now I'm babbling. Did no, I answer the question? You did. Uh, I mean, it was, it's, it's very interesting from your standpoint, you're around, like you said, there's Gen Zers and Gen Alphas like all the time. So what makes them tick, you know? And uh, because communication is key. And as, like you said, I firm Gen Xer, uh, like myself, you know, we've seen the, the evolution between, you know, uh, analog to digital to, um, not using the internet to it being a daily occurrence you know it's just we are very fortunate to be in this generation to see that bridge it's just it wild really, yeah and, and so, also it's kind of nightmarish like yeah. it, it, like how fast technology has changed and the ways in which that we communicate um have changed so drastically it um uh, you know I feel like every day I'm learning something new about a technology and how to be able to integrate that into my day-to-day -day life. And I do wonder when there's going to be a point, like when do, uh, when does one realize that you're, you're um, just an observer and not a participant anymore? Um, <laughs> that's what concerns me. Right. Um, but we live in an incredible era. We really, really do. I mean, I'm, I'm, really one who's welcoming his AI overlords. I, I think AI is going to change the way that we communicate. Um, it's also going to change the way that we trust communications and uh, trust the material that we're reading. And that I think that's going to require a conscientiousness and a, um, a consciousness of what we're consuming and being able to discern and think critically about the stuff that we're seeing on on screen I, there's there's good and there's bad of course but yeah. i think the good is going to outweigh the bad altogether i think that's always the case uh, yeah i'm no like, luddite that's no. that's true but, yep no absolutely i just think we just have to uh, embrace the tool as it is as a tool and figure out how this works over time yep but we're coming to a close so i want to ask the last question that i typically ask everybody um what do you do to unwind slash decompress to get out of your communications bubble and enjoy what the rest of the world offers Oh, wow. So uh, a couple of things. First is read. <laughs> so I, I am a voracious reader. Mm -hmm. um, and I, um, that, that's one way. Gardening is the, the next way. And then I'm also a beekeeper. So, um, you know, working with, with animals, tiny, tiny animals that uh, produce sweet deliciousness. Uh, that is a way for me to get out of my head. And any way for me to get out of my head and, and stop processing is always uh, what I'm going for. So yeah, gardening, beekeeping, and reading. Nice. And what's a good way for people to learn more about uh, what you're doing and uh, Burgess and all that? How do Absolutely. People um th thank you for that opportunity so i am on uh, instagram you can visit me uh, at adr underscore awake um and then you can follow us and the the entrepreneurship journey at burgess at eship.msu.edu and uh you can follow us on on all the the channels from read from that page perfect Thanks again, Aaron, for joining me on the podcast. Really appreciate your time and, the, and your story. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you, Paul, as always, my friend. All right. Excellent. And thank you all again for taking some time in to listen to this program. And don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple weeks. And if there is someone you know of that you would like to hear about their story and their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and leave us a review. Thank you again and see you next time in the Control Center.